You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 206, The 70 Bulls of the Feast of Tabernacles. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. How you doing, sir? Pretty good. You know, I just just listening to the title made me think that there's a there's a joke in there about bull or no bull <laughs> there somewhere. But <laughs> what can we do? When I think of it, the first thing that comes to my mind is a slaughterhouse. I can't imagine the <laughs> sea of red after that's seventy you're bulls. From Texas. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's like a feedlot right there. I mean, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess it would be. We probably should have got yeah. some steak sponsors for this episode. <laughs> right. <laughs> maybe we can go back yeah, and do well, that. I was going to say, maybe maybe too late for that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but that's not a bad idea, I guess. This is our first of several single topic episodes. So um, is there a reason why you picked this one? Well, this was something that um, I got. A, I can't remember how I got the question. It was probably email. Um, it, it may have been in some, you know, Q and a thing somewhere, but somebody asked about this, Hey, are the, are the 70 bulls of, you know, Sukkot, which is the, the Hebrew term, the feast of tabernacles in numbers 29, that's our passage numbers 29, 12 through 34. Are, is the number 70 significant? You know, does this have something to do with the, the sons of God and the nations, you know, that were divided and allotted to the sons of God and all that stuff? So it actually derives from that question uh, that I got, you know, quite some time ago, and so here we are. So that that's how uh, how we came to this. So this is sort of like an extended Q and A. You know, we needed one full episode for this. Well, as we get into it, we're going to post a link to a couple of uh, things here. There's an online source about this that uh, was authored by Dr. Noga Ayali Darshan who I believe is over at the uh, Hebrew University uh, in uh, in Israel. I think that's where she's still at. But she has a journal article, a published journal article, scholarly article that was published in, in 2015 called The 70 Bulls Sacrificed at Sukkot, Numbers 29, 12 through 34, in light of a ritual text from Imar. Okay. Now that article is not obtainable for free online, but Professor uh, Ayali Darshan actually sort of created a shorter version of that for the interested layperson. And that is online. So we're going to post a link to that. And that particular article is entitled this. It's kind of a, an inflammatory title. I guess you need that for online stuff. It's Sukkot's 70 Bulls, the Torah's Adaptation of a Polytheistic Ancient West Semitic Custom of Sacrificing to 70 Gods. Okay, we'll have a link to that online so people can go read that. Now, I'm going to interact with both the online source and her journal article. Uh, we're going to be referencing um, Milgram's commentary on the book of Numbers. And we'll also put a link to uh, www.jewfaq.org about the holiday of Sukkot, just so that people can uh, get familiar with it. I'm going to, again, interact with, with this material, and I'm going to disagree with uh, Ayali Darshan as far as her conclusion, you know, sort of the, the trajectory that she goes off on with respect to this passage. And there's something actually in Milgram's commentary that I think at least hints at a better approach than saying the Israelites were offering to 70 foreign gods. So with that, with that as a setup, uh, let's just you know take a look at the, I'm not going to go through all the all the verses of the passage because it's you know, this day they offered this many bulls and this many lambs and all that sort of stuff. The reference is Numbers 29, 12 through 34, if you do want to go read through the whole thing. And the point is that if you count all the bulls offered in that passage, they add up to 70. And again, the number is what drew the initial interest as far as the question. Now, to get us rolling here, I'm going to quote from uh, her online article. Ayali Darshan's online article, the shorter version. And she writes this. This will help set up the whole topic. 
In describing the offerings for Sukkot, and again, that's the Hebrew term for tabernacles, what we, you know, our English Bibles have as the Feast of Tabernacles. In describing the offerings for Sukkot, the holiday offering section of Parashat Pinchas stipulates the sacrifice of a total of 70 bulls as burnt offerings spread over the seven-day autumn pilgrimage festival, in addition to the other sacrifices of the day. So this isn't the only thing that gets sacrificed. You get 70 bulls and then lots of other things. But again, the, the, the point of interest is the 70. Back to her, her quotation. This huge number of offerings is striking, especially in comparison with other Pentateuchal festivals, none of which requires more than two bulls a day. Scholars have suggested that the double number of rams and lambs on Sukkot relative to matzot, again, the, the bread, the unleavened bread, and the unparalleled 70 bulls sacrificed during the seven-day autumnal festival highlight its importance in the Israelite calendar. It is indeed referred to as the festival. It's the Hebrew there is hachag. Without any further identification in the description of Solomon's dedication of the temple in 1 Kings 8, 65, and also in the law of Ezekiel, that's Ezekiel 45, 25, and in certain rabbinic texts. Now, what she's saying there at the end of the, that quotation, she's saying, look, the fact that you have so many animals offered for this particular festival must mean it had special importance. And it is called the festival, as though everybody who's reading the text, when you, when you get to the festival, they just sort of would know in, in the days of Solomon, in the days of Ezekiel, they know, oh, we're talking about that one. We're talking about the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. That was the festival. Uh, so th this is how she begins you know, her presentation of the issue. And again, it's the amount, therefore, of the sacrifices, and then she's going to zero in on the number 70, and then this reference to the festival, like everybody knew this was the big one, had special significance. Now, before we get too lost in this, we need to talk about, well, what, what is this festival about? You know, what's the meaning of the festival? And this is where I'm going to draw on the website, uh, jewfaq.org. If you just go to that site, look up Sukkot or Tabernacles or something like that just even holidays, you would find this. As far as the meaning of the biblical festival, this is right from that website. It says, the festival of Sukkot, which is outlined in Leviticus 23, begins on Tishri 15, the fifth day after Yom Kippur. That's the Day of Atonement. It is quite a drastic transition from one of the most solemn holidays, Yom Kippur, in our year, to one of the most joyous. Sukkot has a dual significance, historical and agricultural. Historically, Sukkot commemorates the 40-year period during which the children of Israel were wandering in the desert, living in temporary shelters. Agriculturally, Sukkot is a harvest festival and is sometimes referred to as Chag Ha'asif, the festival of ingathering. The word Sukkot means booths. Again, the English Bibles will often have tabernacles, and refers to the temporary dwellings that we are commanded to live in during this holiday in memory of the period of wandering. The name of the holiday is frequently translated Feast of Tabernacles, which, like many translations of Jewish terms, isn't very useful. This translation is particularly misleading because the word tabernacle in the Bible refers to the portable sanctuary in the desert a precursor to the temple called in Hebrew Mishkan. The Hebrew word sukkah and the plural sukkot refers to the temporary booths that people lived in, not to the tabernacle. And lastly, sukkot lasts for seven days. Now that, again, is drawn from the JewFAQ.org website, just about what the festival is. Little, another little rabbit trail, Tishri 15, again, that, that, that date you know, was, was noted in what I just read. Tishri, of course, was the first month of the civil year. Tishri 1 is Rosh Hashanah of the civil year. It was also the year of inauguration of kingly reigns in ancient Judah, southern you know, kingdom. Tishri was usually September or October on the Gregorian calendar. That's why it was associated with you know, ingathering the harvest. Now. On the ecclesiastical calendar, Tishri is the seventh month. And so we have this, this little reference to Tishri. And again, if you're familiar with some of the other things we've done about calendar, you're 
you know, you, you probably were alerted. Your mind was, you know, sort of pricked when you heard Tishri. This is again in the same month, but the, for our considerations, this is the importance of this is going to have to do with the fact that it follows the Day of Atonement, and again, it's it's this sort of festival that commemorates the deliverance or the successful traversing of the wilderness, deliverance from the wilderness, and you know, being able to successfully navigate that journey and, and wind up in the promised land. So now back to our you know, sort of the fundamental question that prompted the whole topic, why the 70 bulls? This is where we want to camp on for the, the rest of the episode primarily. And again, we will have a link to Ayali Darshan's uh, shorter version on our, on our episode page, but this is drawn from her scholarly journal article published in the Vetus Testamentum in 2015. Now, from her online article again, she writes this, while the suggestion that Sukkot was the autumnal New Year festival, in other words, again, think of that in, in the civil calendar, this was Tishri, you know, beginning of the year. While the suggestion that it was the New Year festival, or at least part of the New Year festival, that may explain the double number of rams and lambs offered in relation to other festivals. Okay, so she's conceding that, hey, maybe it was a big deal because it was the New Year thing. Okay. But she adds, it does not explain the additional sacrifice of 70 bulls. Again, the number to her is significant, and I would agree. I think the number is significant. The rabbinic tradition, she writes, was the first to note explicitly that the number of offerings was 70, and the first to draw attention to that. And it links the 70 offerings offered at Sukkot with the 70 nations. You actually have this link created. Somebody, you know, one of, one of the rabbis, this is Tractate Sukkah 55b, Rabbi Elazar states, quote, to what do these 70 bullocks that were offered during the seven days of the festival correspond to the 70 nations? You actually, you know, have that in rabbinical writings. Some, you know, rabbi noticed the number, did the counting, did the math, and, and saw it was 70 and, and wanted to come up with an explanation for that and actually proposed that it had something to do with the 70 nations. Now, that's kind of interesting, just to, to go on a little rabbit trail here, because if you remember re from reading Unseen Realm, or maybe some of you have read my article, Deuteronomy 32.8 and the Sons of God, published in, in Dallas Seminary's journal back, I guess it was 2001, whatever that was. Um, you know, there's this whole issue of how the Masoretic text, the traditional Hebrew text, gets rid of the reference to the sons of God there. But here you have some sense in this rabbinical writing that, okay, this must have something to do with the 70 nations. And what Ayali Darshan is going to do is say, yes, we agree with that. And the, and the number 70 is significant because it's not only 70 nations, it's, you know, you have these, the 70 sons of El from Ugar, the number of the sons of God. So you, you actually have a little bit of a vestige of this worldview, even in uh, the rabbinic writing, even in this, this rabbinic selection, which I find kind of interesting. It, you know, some of it survives despite the alteration of the Hebrew text in the Masoretic text tradition. Now, she adds, Ayali Darshan adds in her journal article the following. She says, rather surprisingly, modern commentators tend to ignore the issue, <laughs> unquote. Yeah, yeah, we, we've we've found that in a number of cases when you get into again the old ancient Near Eastern Israelite worldview. Yeah, lots of commentators just ignore this, and I, and I think you know I think she's trying to be fair here, but I would go further and say a lot of them just aren't even thinking about it. It's just not on the radar. Well, it's it's on her radar, and it's certainly on our radar. Um, so she's well aware of it, and she, what she's going to do in her article, what she does do, and you can get the shorter version for free, is she will apply this to the 70 nations, and not only the nations, but the 70 gods over those nations. And, and her view is that the Israelites, once a year, actually offered sacrifices to these other gods. Okay, And I, that's the part I'm going to disagree with. I think that there's something else going on here. Now, in his numbers commentary, Milgram cites the Midrash in Numbers Rabbah, and this is another Jewish text that's extra biblical, rabbinic material, loosely called. Midr Milgram cites the Midrash in Numbers Rabbah for what is presumably his own explanation. I mean, if you read his commentary, it sounds like this is where he's at too. That this tradition 
relates the 70 bulls to an atonement offering for the 70 nations of the world. Now, that's a little bit different. That's a little bit different than saying that Israelites are offering sacrifices to foreign gods in some sort of vestige of polytheism. Milgram connects this with some kind of atonement offering for the nations of the world. Now, here's the selection that Milgram cites. I'm going to read it to you. This is from Milgram's commentary. And he has content from this, again, rabbinic material in his, his commentary. So I'm going to read you this, the commentary selection. He says, you find that on Sukkot, Israel offers to him, you know, to God, 70 bulls as an atonement for the 70 nations. Israel says, quote, sovereign of the worlds, behold, we offer for them 70 bulls, and they ought to love us, and the nations ought to love us, yet they hate us, as it says, in return for my love, they are my adversaries. That's Psalm 109.4. So the rabbi Milgram is quoting, quotes the Old Testament and says, look, you know, Israel's offering the, these, these bulls for the 70 nations for the atonement. Because remember, Sukkot comes right on the heels of the Day of Atonement for Israel. So you, you have a, a Jewish writer saying, well, this is an atonement for the nations, and, and they ought to love us for doing this, but they hate us. Then he quotes Psalm 109, for in return for my love, they are my adversaries. Now, continuing with Milgram, he says, uh, he's continuing with, the, with the, the quotation, the Holy One, blessed be he, in consequence, said to them, says to the nations, now, therefore, offer a sacrifice on your own behalf. On the eighth day, one bull. And he quotes that Numbers 29, 35 to 36. Now, Milgram says this may be compared to the case of a king who made a banquet for seven days and invited all the people in the province during the seven days of the feast. When the seven days of the feast were over, he said to his friend, we have already done our duty to all the people of the province. Let us now make a shift, you and I, with whatever you can find, a pound of meat or fish or vegetables. In like manner, the Holy One, blessed be he, said to Israel, on the eighth day, you shall hold a solemn gathering. Make shift with whatever you can find with one bull. Now, again, you know, it, you have Milgram mouthing, you know, the words of, of this source. Really, it, it, it's, a, it's actually, you know, really drawn from the source. Again, the, the, the Numbers Rabbah source. And Milgram quotes this to sort of say, well, this is what I think it's about. This is what I think it's about. It's a, it, it has something to do with, with offering atonement for the nations. And the nations could, could care less. They don't, you know, they, they hate the God of Israel anyway, and so on and so forth. Now, Ayali Darshan does not go that direction. She's frankly unsatisfied with that interpretation. And she notes that uh, in her article, in, in the footnotes and whatnot, and she goes through a couple of other options that honestly are, you know, this is me talking now, honestly are a bit more contrived, and she doesn't like any of them. So she's going to go on and offer her own perspective here. And it's kind of an interesting parallel. She, she goes on to cite a ritual text from Emar, just think, you know, ancient Syria, that, that part of the, the world. This is Emar 6, and then line 373. So she cites this text from Emar as providing a better context and explanation. Now, if you had her article, she summarized the text on pages 5 through 6. She says a little bit about it in her online uh, summary of her article. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to summarize it here. I'm not going to go read, you know, the, all the details of this particular text. So here, here are the high points. The text, this, this Emar text, is, a, is about something called the Zucru Festival. It's celebrated in two versions according to other records that are from Emar. Uh, it can be annually celebrated, and it's also celebrated in a seven-year cycle. On both occasions that it was celebrated, you have, had it go for seven days. And so there's you know, sort of a match to Sukkot. And it begins on the 15th of the month. It's another match to Sukkot. Okay, 15 Tishri. The seventh year festival is elaborated in much more detail. It was celebrated in Imar on the first month of the year, called the, in Sumerian, the Sag Mu, namely the head of the year, first of the year. On the first day of the festival, when the moon is full, the god Dagon, or Dagon, D-A-G-A-N, who was the supreme god of Syria, and all the other gods in the pantheon were taken outside the temple. They take, they take their their cult objects, their statues or whatever, they take it outside the temple and the city in the presence of the citizens to a shrine of stones called Sikanu, 
This cultic object, also known in other Syrian cities such as Ugarit and Mari, they were both cities in ancient Syria, this object is best described as a beetle, Stella, that's B-E-T-Y-L, a standing stone anointed with oil and blood. The 70 lambs were then sacrificed to each of the 70 gods of Emar. At the culmination of the ceremony, all the gods and citizens return to the city. On the seventh and final day, Dagon and all the gods of Emar were brought out again to the Sikanu, where a similar ceremony was performed. Over the course of the seven days of the festival, numerous offerings, more than any made in any of the other documented festivals of Emar, were given to all the gods, attesting to the significance of this feast in the city's religious calendar. Now, that, that's a summary, again, drawn from, from the work of Ayali Darshan here. Now, on a side note, you know, she, in her article, again, if you have that, she makes a comment about 70 patron gods that I think she gets wrong. Um, the, 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 the gods of these nations were not given to protect the nations. This is something she, she goes off on. The text never, biblical text never says that. Later second temple texts have that idea, but, but that's not the, the point. They were essentially placeholders. Uh, they weren't, you know, protectors. What are they protecting anybody from? The other God, the God of Israel? It does, doesn't make any sense. It's, it's not what the text says. But anyway, that's a little bit of a rabbit trail. You, you can see generally that there's, you know, some, you know, similarity here to what's going on in this Emar text and this ancient Syrian festival and biblical stuff. Now, let me just stop here and say now, Emar is a city in ancient Syria. One of its neighbors, also in ancient Syria, was Ugarit. Ugarit is where you have the 70 sons of El, you know, and, and all that language, again, that we, you know, we, we have noted both in Unseen Realm and in podcast episodes and in other material that, that I've written either online or in books. Um, and, and lots of other people have noted it too. I mean, there's this relationship between what's going on in, in Ugaritic and at Ugarit. And in this case, we bring Emar into the picture and biblical stuff. And again, we, we've talked about this before and others have as well that the, the the biblical writers are drawing on some of this stuff to make you know cert, their own theological case for the god of israel you know, being in control of the nations and assigning the other gods you never have in, in the in the bible god fathering these other gods with a consort a goddess or anything like that you don't you don't have that so there are there are some clear differences but there's there's this the, there are these theological touch points and the biblical writers are going to touch base with that material, both in terms of a, of a common idea that the, you know, there's Israel and there's, there's these other nations that God abandoned and disinherited because of the sin at Babel. And they're just placeholders now. And then they become corrupt. It's Psalm 82, Isaiah 34. They're going to be judged. All that stuff that we've covered a lot on this podcast before. So there, there's going to be these common touch points, but there's a theological trajectory that the biblical writers take with that material that is quite different from anything you'd see at Ugarit, that is quite different from religion in ancient Syria, you know, their, their theological worldview. They do this because this material was familiar to Israelites. Syria is next door. Again, Baal and, you know, other, other gods associated with Ugarit and the Syrian pantheon, these are the chief competitors to the worship of Yahweh. The prophets are they have their hands full with this stuff all of the time. And so it's, it's very understandable that they're going to be referencing this material both in a positive and a negative way, you know, positively like, okay, you know, we've got this shared you know, worldview, this shared idea, but you know, these are not other gods to worship. They are underlings. They, are, they, are, they were actually assigned as a punishment to the nations. These are not you know, this isn't at the level of the most high, you know, and all that, all that kind of talk. So there's a reason for, again, the, the commonalities, but we want to, you know, we want to not miss the messaging that's different, the messaging that the biblical writers have that goes with this. And I think Ayali Darshan, that, that's kind of what she does. She sort of misses an opportunity to look at some specific messaging that, that Milgram actually is going to bring up. And and she just sort of either she, – she doesn't talk about it in, in her article. She either misses or she sidesteps or she doesn't think it's important. Uh, if she does notice it, that and, that, and I'm going to follow a, a different trajectory with all this. So what she does, though, obviously, is she takes this material that we've just you know overviewed, we've just summarized, and she says this. Here's from her conclusion uh, on page nine of her article, her published article. She writes, 
In light of the Emerite custom, I would like to propose that the law in Numbers 29 prescribing the offering of 70 bulls during Sukkot, which has no parallel in, other ancient, in, in any other Israelite festival, reflects the old Syrian custom of offering 70 sacrifices to the 70 gods. In other words, the whole pantheon of, of Syria at the grand festival celebrated in the month of the new year. Over time, the polytheistic traces of this ancient custom disappeared from the priestly law, from the Torah, and the autumnal New Year festival in the Pentateuchal calendar also lost its significance. The 70 sacrifices, however, have been preserved in the text, in the, in the book of Numbers here, a sole remnant of the local or the ancient local tradition of sacrificing 70 offerings to 70 gods at the New Year festival. End of quote. So that's her conclusion. That's where, that's where she winds up with this. Now, I don't find that conclusion very persuasive. It's really based on a single presumption, and that is that the offerings of these bulls are for or to the nations, and, and therefore logically they're gods. That isn't what the text ever says. Okay, Numbers, Numbers 29 never actually says that, and, and neither does any, any other text, because obviously this is the only place you're going to find this. It, it's unique to the festivals. The, the text never says that. The text doesn't suggest that the nations and their gods are the object or objects of these sacrifices. Now, the rabbinic midrash that you know, gets quoted is what it is, but again, that's not the, the biblical text, and it's, it, it's made up. I mean, it's an effort to, to do something with the passage, to give it meaning, to interpret it. And I think Ayali Darshan is allowing that midrash with its idea that, that th these are sacrifices to or for the nations and their gods, these other 70. I think she's allowing that to have a bit too much influence on her reading of what's going on here. So I have a different proposal. Now, a couple of things here before I get to, to um, you know, sort of where I land. We have the number 70. Again, 70 speaks to the totality of the pantheon. Everybody agrees on, on, on this point. Uh, and it even was referenced in Ayali Darshan's, you know, uh, her, her summary that we just gave. Seventy refers to the totality of the pantheon, all the other gods. Now, again, this is an uh, I, I, I want to land here just for a minute because I get this question a lot. You know, what about the other nations that aren't in the Bible? You know, do they have you know other gods over them? You know, did they get a sign? Like, what about Australia and China and you know, all these places that aren't mentioned in the Bible? Okay, seventy is about totality. The whole point of the Deuteronomy 32 worldview is that any place that isn't Israel was disinherited by God. It's not God's land. It's not the promised land. It's not the land that he chose for himself or his people. That means every other place is under the dominion of something else. So it doesn't matter if you have a nation that isn't you know, listed in the 70 in Genesis chapter 10. The whole point of it is totality. So the answer is, yeah, all of those other nations are not Yahweh's. I mean, he, he has disinherited them from his, from his loving covenantal relationship. It's Israel and everybody else. So I get that question a lot, and, and I think we need to, to remember that, that 70 is about the totality here. And in Genesis 10, it is the totality. If you actually count up the nations, that's what you get. And if you use the Septuagint, you get 72, which is why in the New Testament, when Jesus sends out 70 or 72, it just depends on which text the New Testament translator is giving preference to, the Masoretic text or the Septuagint. It refers to the same place, Genesis 10, Table of Nations. Another note, the festival, Milgram says, it focuses on man's need and desire to give thanks to God for the year's harvest. Fair enough. But what does it commemorate? This, this I think, is the, is the main point. This is the main point I'm going to follow that, it gets, that gets lost here. We've got Ayali Darshan zeroing in on the 70 and saying, oh, well, this is you know, this is a polytheistic reflex, a polytheistic vestige. And, and then she, she, again, allows the Midrash to influence her too much. She allows the rabbinic idea to, that these offerings were two or four, the other nations and their gods, I think, to have too much weight. Again, Milgram has this idea of atonement, that the sacrifices are to atone for the other nations. He, neither of them really focus on what in the world Sukkot commemorates. It's not just about agriculture. Remember, even, even you know, Ayali Darshan, I think it was her, 
there, there was oh no, it was the Jew FAQ. It has it has two focuses: historical and agricultural. Agriculturally, yeah, it's about God meets our needs. We have a harvest. Good, fair enough. But what does it commemorate historically? This is lost in both Ayali Darshan's take and Milgram's take. Now Sukkot has this dual significance. We are, let's not focus only on the agriculture. Historically, it commemorates, this is back to JewFAQ.org. I'm just going to quote it again. Historically, Sukkot commemorates the 40-year period during which the children of Israel were wandering in the desert. Okay, They were living in temporary shelters. What does the desert symbolize in biblical thinking? And this is also recalling the Day of Atonement. Remember, the Day of Atonement has this wilderness theme in it, too. Okay, and the Day of Atonement, which you know, is linked to this festival as well, the Day of Atonement has the goat for Azazel sent out into the wilderness. Why? It's not a sacrifice to Azazel. And again, you can read about this in Unseen Realm. I'm not going to rehearse all the content there. It's because the wilderness is the place geographically, as they're wandering through the desert, where is the presence of God among his people? It's in the camp. It's in the tabernacle. When they camp, you know, the, the, the whole, that, that becomes holy ground where the presence of God is and the people encamped around it. Everywhere else out there in the wilderness is under dominion of hostile gods because of the punishment of Deuteronomy 32. The wilderness is where sin belongs because that land, that territory is under the dominion of entities that are hostile to Yahweh and his people. Because of their punishment, they become corrupt. Deuteronomy 32, 17, they seduce the Israelites into sacrificing to them. Again, this is all old unseen realm turf. If you haven't read the, the book, then you need to go back and do that. Or you can watch the videos here on the podcast site for you know, where to begin. Just click on that tab and you, you'll, you'll know what we're talking about here. The wilderness is where sin belongs. It was associated with ground under dominion of, of other gods. It was a fearful place. It was associated with death. It's the place where you could find gateways to the, to the netherworld, like in Bashan, okay? Ashtaroth and Edrai, in, in texts that were external to the Bible, you know, the whole gates of hell thing. This is where, you know, you, you could go to these places and you know these are these are ways you know places that you could go if you wanted to to enter into the netherworld the underworld the realm of the dead again the scary place the place where you know the rephaim spirits live bashan again was was rephaim territory all these ideas are are part of this matrix that get associated with the wilderness and israel has to trek through all of this turf and they're actually punished you know to wander around in it for 40 years you know, so they can see that God protects them and sustains them while they're, again, surrounded by enemies, surrounded by, by cosmic, you know, spiritual enemies. You want to know what spiritual warfare is? This was it. I mean, they're, they're trusting God to, to provide for them while they're in the worst possible position they could be in. And that is what Sukkot is about, their deliverance from this situation. Again, wilderness is the place of chaos and death and hostility. It is unholy ground. And Sukkot, five days after you know, the Day of Atonement, you have Sukkot, which celebrates the deliverance from this place, from these entities, from these supernatural forces that want death and destruction and chaos for Israel. That's what Sukkot is about. So how in the world? Why in the world would they offer 70 bulls to these other entities? They don't need to do that. They were just delivered. They don't need to turn around and say, oh, we better make those entities happy now. No, the entities lost. Okay, the entities were held at bay. They could not defeat the God of Israel and harm Israel. There's no need to placate them now. You don't placate a defeated enemy. It just doesn't make sense. So again, I, I just think it's a wrong trajectory. Now back to Milgram. Milgram writes in his commentary, this is page 247, he says, Rabbinic tradition may be correct in stating that the total of the 70 bulls represents all the nations of the world, assumed a number 70. Again, I'm, I'm with you. 
This festival, focusing on man's need and desire to give thanks to God for the year's harvest, is of universal appeal. Again, I would add, that's not all it's for. It's not just agricultural, you know, Dr. Milgram. It, it's, it's more. It's about it's celebrating deliverance and from, from these supernatural forces. Back to Milgram. It is small wonder. Now, this is, this is again, the, a, an important observation he makes. It is small wonder that Zechariah prophesied that Sukkot would become a universally observed festival at Zechariah 14, 16, and that the pilgrims at Plymouth modeled the Thanksgiving celebration for their first harvest on the biblical paradigm. This is where we get Thanksgiving, by the way. You know, that this, this whole idea, they actually, pilgrims actually modeled it after this particular feast. So yeah, we'll give you that it's about harvest, but even the pilgrims, it seems, could, could recognize deliverance. It's not just about having enough food. It's about deliverance. And the, the observation in Zechariah 14 is the one I, I want to sort of key on, that Zechariah prophesies that this, this festival, this particular festival, would become a universally observed festival. So how about this? How about this, this interpretation? The 70 bulls are offered to commemorate deliverance from the totality of the gods hostile to Israel. It's an expression of joy, not to placate other gods or to kiss up to them. It's not to ask Yahweh to show favor in some act of common grace to those nations and their gods. Rather, it is to thank Yahweh for deliverance from those gods during the wilderness wanderings. Honestly, it just doesn't seem too complicated to me. Now, Zechariah 14, 16 is interesting. If you take that view, okay, the, the view that this is my view of it, if you take that view, Zechariah 14, 16 becomes kind of interesting. Again, how does the view of Ayali Darshan make sense of that passage, of the Zechariah 14, 16 passage? We might as well you know, go to Zechariah 14 and just, just read that. By the way, Zechariah 14, does that ring a bell? Zechariah 14 ring a bell? I'm going to read the whole thing, and you'll, you'll see where verse 16 comes in, the, the whole thing about the Feast of Sukkot. Ayali Darshan's interpretation that just doesn't make sense in light of this passage in Zechariah. In fact, it, it robs it of some, some real significance here. So here's Zechariah 14. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. Okay, does it sound familiar? <laughs> and the city shall be taken, and the house is plundered, and the women raped. Half of the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations, as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. This is that that's that's the idea that is quoted in Acts chapter 1, by the way, when Jesus ascends. Men of Galilee, you know, the, the angel says, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they return to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. That's where they are. They're on the Mount of Olives. So back to Zechariah 14, the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, okay? and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. And you shall flee to the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azal, and you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. Now this and what follows is, is the sourcing of Re in Revelation for Armageddon. It's about the transformation of the cosmos and the restoration of the Lord's rule in these awful circumstances. Verse 6, Isaiah or Zechariah 14, On that day there shall be no light, cold, or frost. And there shall be a unique day which is known to the Lord, neither day or night, but at evening time there shall be light. On that day, living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea, 
and half of them to the Western Sea. Again, this, this transformation of the cosmos. It shall continue in summer as in winter. Verse 9, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. There's the restoration of, of the Lord's rule. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. The whole land shall be turned into a plain from Giva to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem shall remain aloft on its site from the gate of Benjamin to the place of the former gate to the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananel to the king's wine presses. And it shall be inhabited, for there shall never again be a decree of utter destruction. Jerusalem shall dwell in security. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the peoples that wage war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they are still standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets, and their tongues will rot in their mouths. And on that day, a great panic from the Lord shall fall on them, so that each will seize the hand of another, and the hand of the one will be raised against the hand of the other. Even Judah will fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the surrounding nations shall be collected, gold, silver, and garments in great abundance. And a plague like this plague shall fall on the horses, the mules, the camels, the donkeys, and whichever beast may be in those camps. Well, what's the point? The point is that on that day when the Lord returns, there will be complete victory and transformation of the cosmos. And then we read verse 16. Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of booths, the feast of Sukkot. The point again is the remnant of the nations themselves will keep the feast of Sukkot. You know, the, the feast that commemorates Yahweh's deliverance of his people from them, from those hostile nations and the gods that, that, that rule over them. The nations are forced, you know, the survivors are in a situation where they turn and celebrate Israel's deliverance from them. Now, there's a, a couple of ways you could read this, you know, and, and, and part of this depends on, on how you sort of think about eschatology, and really, even more fundamentally, how you think about the New Testament's use of the Old Testament. There we go again. I mean, we keep coming back to that issue. I'm going to read a little bit from Boda, uh, Mark Boda, his commentary on Zechariah here. He writes this, again, just to help us, you know, get the flavoring here. While Zechariah 14.9 depicted Yahweh's kingship over all the land of Judah, 1416 makes it clear that this kingship extends over all the earth. As noted above, in reference to 149, kingship is directly linked to victory in war, and so the focus on kingship in 1416 is appropriate following the depiction of Yahweh's total annihilation of the armies which had attacked Jerusalem. Yahweh's victory establishes him as an emperor over a large territory who receives now obeisance and tribute expressed and delivered by yearly attendance at the Feast of Tabernacles. This connection between kingship and victory is made clear in the title and name of Yahweh cited in verse 16 and verse 17, the King, the Lord of hosts. The latter, of course, referring to his role as the divine warrior at the head of a mighty heavenly army. Again, this is the passage is quoted in the, in the Armageddon section. And also, I think, you know, alluded to in the Revelation 20, you know, uh, section, you know, of the book of Revelation. So what's my point in the Zechariah rabbit trail? Rather than Sukkot being a vestige of polytheism, offering 70 bulls to the gods and the nations or for their behalf or to, to sort of help them out, to, to chum up to them, the 70 symbolizes deliverance from the gods of the nations by Yahweh. Why 70 bulls? Because Yahweh delivered Israel from every other god. He delivered them from the totality of the other gods and their nations. It has nothing to do with sacrificing to those gods. And if it ever did in the mind of some Israelite somewhere at some point of time, Again, the biblical text, the, the worldview expressed in the biblical text as we have it, sets that record straight. This is deliverance from the wilderness, the totality of turf that is not Yahweh's turf. God delivers his people from the totality of every supernatural power. That's what it's about. Again, I don't think it's really that complicated. 
Zechariah 14, 16 bolsters this because Sukkot is the festival in which the people of the nations who have been enemies of Yahweh will be required to celebrate. It will be a gesture of submission. This makes better sense if the original offering of the 70 bulls was about deliverance from the nations. At the day of the Lord, the nations will have been defeated. And any remnant that survives Yahweh's judgment, anybody who's allowed to live in the New Jerusalem, now catch that idea, anybody who's allowed to live in the New Jerusalem will also thank Yahweh for his victory, the victory of the Messiah, because it is that victory that transformed the cosmos, that makes the world new, that takes us back to Eden. Now, I know some listeners just can't divorce the words of Zechariah 14 from a particular or, or a few particular pop, popular eschatological schemes. But I'm going to suggest that to understand it abstractly like this is to make sense of it. Okay, you can't literalize everything here because items in Zechariah 14 make no literal sense after the second coming. You just, just read the rest of the passage. So I would say, again, try to think a little bit more abstractly. Try to think you know, more like, I hate to say it, but more like an Israelite, more like a biblical, you know, one of the biblical writers. Why are there some Gentiles who are still around in the new earth, in the new Jerusalem, that will celebrate the Feast of Sukkot as both a gesture of, of Yahweh's victory over their gods, over you know, the gods who had enslaved them? The, the, the answer is because they're part of the remnant. They're part of the people of God. The remnant of the nations after the cross looks different than they did before the cross. And that's okay. The end of Zechariah is transformed in terms of its fulfillment and meaning, I would say, just like Amos 9, 11 through 12 was. And I don't want to rabbit trail in, into that. But if you remember, we, we've had a, a, I think we did a podcast episode on this, or at least it's been part of a QA. and a Amos 9, uh, 11 through 12 is the one that says this, in that day, I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. Now, you think that refers to like a, a new building, maybe a new temple or something like that, but it doesn't. It doesn't. And we know that because of the way it's quoted in Acts 15, the, the next verse. You know, So in that day, I'll raise up the booth of David that has fallen. In verse 12, why, am I, why is God going to raise up the booth of, the, of David, repair its breaches and its ruins, that they may possess the remnant of Edom? and all the nations who are called by my name. So it sounds like if you're reading Amos, that God is going to you know, do something that will allow Israel, the national Israel, to possess the remnant of Edom, you know, like to, to conquer its enemies. And we talked about this. Edom was a metaphor for chaos and Babylon because you know, they helped the Babylonians at the destruction of the temple. We, we spent two episodes on Obadiah where we got into this whole issue. But what does the New Testament do with this passage? It's not about conquest of, of turf anymore. If you look at it in Acts 15, the booth of David turns out to be Jesus. It's not a building. It's Jesus. And, and they don't possess the remnant of Edom. Edom, Edom, Aleph, Dalet, Mem, is transformed to Adam, to mankind. It's about mankind coming to Christ. It's about the Gentiles being included in the family of God under the Messiah. And I'm suggesting that's the way we need to read Zechariah 14 here too. It, it really helps. It helps make sense of it, that you have when, at, at the Lord's return and Revelation quotes Zechariah 14 in relationship to the second coming, victory, you know, halting the forces at Armageddon. Uh, again, and I, I think that that passage is mirrored in, in Revelation 20. Uh, you know, people are going to hear this and go, oh, he's an amillennialist. No, I'm not an amillennialist or a postmillennialist. Uh, I, I still believe the kingdom comes to earth. I'm not any system. So throw the systems out. Don't worry about them. Okay? The text is more important than systems. What you have going on, though, is you have the Lord returning at that day, day of the Lord. He returns. And the Gentiles who survive this, the vestiges of the other nations who are allowed to live and enter into a transformed cosmos, a new Eden, a new heaven, and a new earth, of course they're going to celebrate the Feast of Sukkot. Of course they're going to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Why? Because the Feast of Tabernacles commemorates God's deliverance, his superiority and victory over all other gods. It's how it's supposed to end. 
And if you're a Gentile, again, who are outside the family of Israel, the, the physical descendants of Abraham, you're included, again, if you, are, if you align yourself with the God of Israel, who became incarnate in Jesus Christ. Okay, it's, very, it's very coherent and cohesive. If we can, on one hand, not view this through the lens of the rabbis, oh, they're sacrificing to other gods, vestige of polytheism, or they're sacrificing bulls to, to like make God look more favorable on those nations and, and atone for them in some way, you know, even and the nations hate, hate God, so I don't, I don't know how that works. I mean, you need to change your heart here. I don't know how that works. So instead of looking at it you know, in, in that way, why don't we just take it, take Sukkot for what it is historically, not just agriculturally. Historically, it's about deliverance from the wilderness, through the wilderness, from the wilderness, and, and just the realm of death and darkness that was under the dominion of other gods. It, again, it doesn't seem complicated to me. Of course, there's 70 because the idea is to commemorate Yahweh's victory on behalf of his people over the totality of the powers of darkness, every other, every other supernatural being. And when that's celebrated in the future, at the Lord's return, of course it makes sense. Of course it makes sense that, that the Gentiles who are allowed, you know, who are not annihilated, they survive you know, into the new set of circumstances by going up you know, and worshiping the Lord. That implies a switch of loyalty. Their believing loyalty is now in the God of Israel. And of course, they would celebrate the Feast of Sukkot in his honor and out of gratitude, because look where they are. Look where they are. So again, I, the, the subject is interesting. I hope it's been interesting uh, you know, for you. But again, I, my, that, that's my view. That's my view of the whole 70 bowls of Sukkot thing. So if you want to read Ayali Darshan's uh, article, please do. We'll have the link to that, the one online anyway, not her journal article. That's not freely accessible. And that's my take on it. I think it's really a neat part and, again, a cohesive element, cohesive part of what we call here you know, on the podcast or the Unseen Realm of the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. I think it fits in real nicely. That 70 number is always coming up, Mike. And um, also, <laughs> also, you know what? Is seventy this year, don't you? Well, it isn't me. No, it's the seventieth <laughs> anniversary of what? Oh yes, yep. The founding of the state of Israel, yep. And where will that's we a very be? that's a very nice segue. <laughs> that's a and, great segue. And me. where will we be on that day? <laughs> yeah, we will be we will be in Israel. And Ooh. as far as I know, there were still five or six openings left. So I, that might be where you're angling here. Exactly. We will be in Jerusalem on that exact date. Ni nicely done. Thank Nicely you. done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Some other things here. I'm going to switch gears. Is uh, I noticed we have over 500 ratings on iTunes for the podcast. So wow. thank you yeah. for everybody who has done that, and over 200 reviews. So thank you all for taking the time to do that. And if yep. you haven't done so, we're on Facebook. We got almost 2,000 people in our Naked Bible group having great conversations every day. So. Go like the Naked Bible Podcast page. Uh, Mike's got a public page, so go like his uh, Michael S. Mm -hmm. Heiser. Yeah, we're, we're we're trying to put our focus there. Yep, yep. Michael S. Heiser. Yep. So go like his page, like the Naked Bible Podcast page. Uh, we have a paranormal page for those that are interested for that, and then also you can join the groups mm -hmm. for both of those. So get in there and uh, uh, have some great conversations. Um, yep. Subscribe to the newsletter, too. Go to drmsh.com. It's on the right-hand side. Why should I subscribe? Click on that, and it'll tell you. All right. Sounds good, Mike. All right. Well, with that, I just want to thank you, everybody, for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.